For the last two Sabbaths, we've been considering some prophetic messages from the book of Revelation uh, with, first of all, but a short time. And then last Sabbath, the Israel issue. I brought these messages because as Adventist people, we need to be watching what's happening in our world. Believe me, all of the stuff that's spouting out of White House and our president that needs prayer um, is fitting into a puzzle. And we ought to examine and see what's happening. Uh, these messages are not glorified, hallelujah, praise the Lord, shout messages, but they are messages for us to think and study and watch the events. But more than that, it is for us to wake up and get our lamps trimmed and burning. For as the revelation says, the time is short. The time is short. And so I pray that you will wake up today and that there are those that do not understand, will understand what God's word says. So this morning, the last message of this series is entitled The Real Armageddon, and I actually probably need more than one sermon to cover it, but I will try to see if we can do it in one. If you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter 16 and verses 12 through 16, Revelation chapter 16 and verses 12 through 16, and here is what it declares. And the sixth angel, which angel, everybody? Sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Do you know what you're reading? And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils, can you believe it? Working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And then Jesus comes in and says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked and see his shame. And then the last verse, if you have it, you can read it with me. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, what's the word, everybody? Armageddon. The mere mention of this word is chilling, frightening, Shocking, arresting, and alarming. Armageddon, the future mega mother of all wars. Armageddon, the world's last cataclysmic war to end all wars. Armageddon, the concluding conflict that will bring global destruction. Armageddon. The prophetic biblical word for doomsday, Armageddon, a future horrific nuclear holocaust that can annihilate all life on this planet. In modern times, this term Armageddon has been used to designate and describe any great military war or titanic violent struggle among the nations. In the 20th century, we've already witnessed uh, two Armageddons, the horrible carnage of World War I, and then the horrible destruction and devastation of World War II. At the end of the Second World War, the mushroom cloud of the atomic bomb over Japan, where instantly two, over 200,000 people were killed, signaled the dawning of the deadly atomic age and the terrible prospect of a world-ending nuclear war. In recent history, 
The world has come dangerously close to a global disaster of nuclear war. Maybe some of you remember that in October of 1962, President John Kennedy was faced with what is called the Cuban Missile Crisis when the then Soviet Union secretly sent nuclear missiles to Cuba aimed at the United States that could have escalated into a nuclear war. When the Cuban crisis was over and the Russians removed their nuclear weapons, President Kennedy famously declared that we should never forget man must put an end to war or war will put an end to mankind. Currently, there are five recognized nations that have nuclear weapons. Recognized, there are others that have them, we don't, not sure. United States, Russia, France, China, and England. Two other nations are reputed to also have nuclear weapons, India and Pakistan. And then, as we know in the recent news, two other nations are seeking to obtain or increase their nuclear armed capability. That is North Korea and Iran. I'm going to bring you up to date real quick. June the 12th, 19, 2018, President Trump met with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un in Singapore to negotiate the ending of their nuclear missiles test and to reduce their nuclear weapon arsenal and try to eliminate the threat of a nuclear attack on the United States. Y'all remember that, don't you? President Trump proclaimed after the summit that there was no longer a nuclear threat from North Korea. Who believes that? Nothing has really changed and North Korea still remains a dangerous threat with their nuclear arms. Also, President Trump has withdrawn from the Iranian nuclear agreement that former President Barack Obama carefully negotiated with the other Western nations to keep Iran from developing nuclear weapons. And now the United States is isolated from its Western nation allies who all support the Iranian nuclear deal and now President Trump had made it a very made it very risky and uncertain with Iran and its nuclear weapons plans. All of these re recent events have simply made the prospect of a future nuclear war a clear and present danger. Am I right about it? Perhaps an even greater danger that exists would be if a nuclear weapon should ever fall in the hands of radical extremists or a terrorist network or nation like Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. They would detonate a nuclear attack that would not only destroy thousands of lives but it could trigger a nuclear war. Many evangelical and futurist Christians believe that Armageddon will be the final earthly war that will be literally fought in the Middle East. I talked about that last Sabbath. Christian rapturists believe that the battle of Armageddon will happen after the secret rapture of the church when Christians that are ready for the rapture will simply disappear and then there will be a tribulation period. And they believe that during the tribulation period, Armageddon will be fought in the Middle East uh, by, uh, led by an antichrist. Uh, and Israel will be the center of the Armageddon battle that will be led by the false Christ with Russia and China and other nations. And they believe that hundreds of thousands of unbelieving Jews will be slain and those that are still alive will be converted to Christianity. 
In fact, the Middle East is a hotbed of hostilities, as you know, between the Arabs and the Israelis. And President Trump's recent uh, remove, moving of our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem has only heightened uh, the hostilities. It is the location of the world's greatest and richest oil fields. It is the headquarters of some of the most violent and extreme factions of the Islamic world. It is a place where the world's three dominant religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, is practiced and revered and claim. And so many believe that the Middle East could very well factor in the final end of Armageddon. So my friends, the question is, what is the real Armageddon? What is the real truth about a future nuclear, a future war of Armageddon? Will it be a nuclear third war among the nations that will wipe out all of humanity and destroy the planet? Will it be a religious Middle Eastern war after the rapture, during the great tribulation that will destroy a great majority of Jews and others and usher in the coming of Christ and the kingdom of God? What does the Bible actually say about Armageddon? And what details does it reveal about the Armageddon event? Well, the good news is, can I give you all some good news? Because it all sounds bad, doesn't it? You need some good news, don't you? The good news is that Armageddon is not going to be a cataclysmic nuclear war of world annihilation. God is not going to let man destroy this world and end this world himself. That's good news. The Bible reveals that God's not going to allow man to destroy the world. Man didn't create the world and God isn't going to let him destroy it. Can you praise the Lord for that? In fact, the Bible says, listen to this, God is going to destroy them that try to destroy the earth. Oh, let me, let me, let me back that out. God will destroy them that destroy the earth. You know, we ought to be real, Adventists ought to be real ecologists. We ought to take care of the planet. Take care of the water. Take care of, uh, of all, all of, get, get rid of garbage. Watch the throwing a uh, uh, plastic because it ends up in the ocean. Uh, God is going to destroy them. Revelation eleven eighteen 18 says, and thou shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Those that are trashing the earth as well as those that are planning to destroy the earth. The nations that have nuclear weapons and those that are building nuclear weapons the terrorists and the unstable, violent, rogue nations who are trying to get their hands on the nuclear weapons, the Bible warns that God will destroy them before they destroy the earth. Can you say amen? Oh no, God's not going to let man destroy what he has made. And when the end comes, it's not going to be man to bring it to pass. God is going to bring it to pass. Can you say amen? Secondly, the Bible does not teach that Armageddon is going to actually be a military war. I want you to get this. It will not be a military war between the nations of the earth. It will not be a battle between the United States and Iran or the United States and North Korea or the United States and Russia or China or Iran against Israel. Armageddon will not be a human militaristic war. We've had enough of them already. Can you say amen? Also, Armageddon is not going to be triggered by some terrorist network or organization. In fact, from what the Bible reveals, watch this. Armageddon will not primarily be a Middle Eastern war. It may involve the Middle East, but it will not simply be in the Middle East. From, from the, what the Bible reveals, Armageddon will not be a political military war that will end the world. This term Armageddon is a biblical prophetic event 
that comes exclusively from the book of Revelation. If you will look in your Bible, nowhere else but in Revelation can you find this word Armageddon. And it is only found in one verse, in one text of the Bible, Revelation 16, 16. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now the book of Revelation is God's last prophetic book to the world. It is his last prophetic revelation. It is written in prophetic language with prophetic symbols so that, I want you to get this, when you read the book of Revelation, please do not take everything it says literally. Everything it says. There are some literal things. I do believe there will be a holy city. Can you say amen? I believe that it will come down from God out of heaven. Is that right? I believe that Christ will come. Is that right? But there's some things that are simply prophetic symbols. And therefore, Armageddon is a cold word whose mystery uh, can be understood and revealed as we move and watch the events. So I want us to look at the book of Revelation and examine what it reveals about Armageddon. The prophet opens the curtains of the future and allows us to see some details, not everything, but some details about this great battle of Armageddon. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 16 says, begins by saying, The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the frog's prophet. And it ends with verse 16 by saying, uh, And he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. First, verse 16 reveals that Armageddon is not a human militaristic war. It is the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Watch this. Y'all missed it. In other words, the Bible never really calls it the battle of Armageddon. It calls it the battle of the great day of God Almighty. You see, the mistake that most people make is that Armageddon is not man's war, it is God's war. And guess if it's God's war, guess who's going to win? The Bible says it's the great day of God Almighty. It is the great day of God. It's the day of God's wrath. It is the day of God's vengeance. It is the day of God's strange act. It is God's time and God's day. I'm telling you, folk, uh, you might wonder why God lets all this stuff pile up, but it reaches a point where God says, that's it. Time for me to come in clean house. Come for me to straighten out the nations. Time for me to stop all this craziness. Time for me to end this rebellion of sin. The Bible says it's the great day of God. All right. You know, um, right now, man is having his day. That's why the world is so messed up. Is that right? Our world is so troubled, torn, and, and has messed up so bad. And, and, and I want to tell you that you cannot trust men to govern. Because all have what? Sin. And come what? Sort of the glory of God. So there's nobody that can actually rule and govern perfectly because we're all sinners. Am I right about it? And therefore you can't trust everybody. As much as I love Barack Obama, he made some mistakes. Am I right about it? 
Man is having his day right now with destroying the planet and the ozone layer and, and, and trashing the planet. Man is having his day with nuclear uh, arms uh, and talking about nuclear war. The man is having his day with crime uh, and not stopping guns uh, and even police shooting innocent people. Uh, man is having his day and that's why we are in the crisis that we're in because it's man's day. Not only is it man's day, it's the devil's day. He's gaining momentum. He's unleashing his demonic power. And as we move toward the end of time, we will see more and more the explosion of satanic power. And the Bible says he's going to literally perform miracles and signs and wonders. He is feverishly working on the hearts of men. I told you, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. The devil started his career as a snake. But in Revelation, he grew up into a dragon. That shows you how angry, vicious, and violent he is. He is a fire-breathing, symbolic dragon. And so man has had his day. The devil has had him his day. While the God of heaven has been sitting back in the shadows, biding his time. Oh, I'm about ready to preach now. I love when Martin Luther King used to say, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet that scaffold weighs the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within his throne, uh, keeping watch above his own. Uh, God sometimes uh, has to wait and let man have his day, uh, let the devil have his day, uh, and then God steps in and says, it's all over now, I'm having my day. And when God has his day, it'll be his day forever. Can I show you a few examples of God's day? You remember back in the antediluvian world when the world became so wicked and every imagination of man was, was only evil continually and God told Noah to build an ark. He said, because I'm going to have my day. And the cataclysmic fury of God uh, poured out in a flood uh, that utterly destroyed uh, the earth. Uh, and everybody that was not aboard the ark perished in the waters of the flood. The people of our black ancestry said that God gave Noah the rainbow sign. It won't be water but fire next time. God had another day when two violent ancient cities became so immorally perverted and violently explosive that they had gay rights before we had gay rights. And God looked at Sodom and Gomorrah and told Abraham, they got to go. I got to have my day with Sodom and Gomorrah. And God rained down fire and brimstone on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and hit those cities with the devastation of it. I often wondered if God hit Sodom and Gomorrah with an atomic blast. Scientists can't even find where Sodom and Gomorrah were. And so God sometimes has his day, and when he does, it's a day of reckoning, a day of judgment, a, a day of vengeance, a, a day of the omnipotent punishment from the hand of God. Oh, let me tell you, we ought to be glad that God's day doesn't come very often, can you say amen? But one day at Armageddon, God's going to have his final day. <laughs> At Armageddon, there's going to be a final conflict, a final controversy, a final uh, controversy, the final battle and the final war, and that conflict, God will pour out his destruction on the earth. Remember, Armageddon is not the battle of Armageddon. It is the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Let the church say amen. And I want you to know when God has this last day, it's going to be God's day forever. <laughs> Can you say amen? The kingdom of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign, what, forever and ever. Now, let's look at the context of Armageddon, and i got to quickly move. 
First of all, Armageddon, says the book of Revelation chapter uh, 16, is, the, is one of the seven last plagues of God's wrath that will be poured out upon this wicked world. Revelation 15, God describes angels with the vials of the seven last plagues. And the Bible reveals that Armageddon will be the sixth of the seven plagues. It will be before time ends. God will pour out his wrath and his punishing plagues upon the wickedness of this world. Now, the Bible reveals that the seven last plagues will be poured out when probation on the earth has finally ended. Now, let me explain what probation means. It means that God has a time where the end comes before the end comes. In other words... When God finally says it is done, it is finished, when Christ steps out of the most holy place, when it's time for Michael to stand up, human probation will end and people will freeze in whatever spiritual condition they are in. When probation ends. He will say, he that is filthy, let him be. He that is righteous, let him be. He that is holy, let him be. Holy still, behold, I come quickly. There will be a period of time when probation will end and trouble will hit this world like it has never done before. Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 says there will be a time of trouble such as not since there was a nation even at that same time. And let me tell you why the trouble time of trouble will be so horrific and so horrible. You think it's bad now? You ain't seen nothing yet. You think it was bad during the World War II and, and all of the killing and all of the Holocaust and all of that? You think it's bad now with all the shootings? You ain't seen nothing yet. You better buckle your seatbelt. Two things that make the time of trouble the worst time the earth has ever seen. First of all, our inspired messenger says the Holy Spirit will be withdrawn from the earth. The Holy Spirit will be withdrawn from the earth. Second of all, the Bible says in Revelation 7 that the angels that are holding the four winds will now let them go. The winds of strife, the winds of trouble, the winds of destruction that angels are holding back. And you know, it's, you wonder, you say, well, wow, if they're holding it back now, what is there left to hold? They're going to let them go and you talk about a hurricane of trouble and a hurricane of problems and a hurricane of terrible things, the Holy Spirit will be withdrawn and the angels will let the winds blow. Finally, it'll be the worst time of trouble because Satan will be let loose with his full power. His full angelic power for the plagues of God's wrath will be poured out upon the earth for the wickedness that has taken place. And when the plagues of God's wrath begin to be poured out, the devil will tell people, see what God did to you? He'll put it all on God. Second thing, the Battle of Armageddon is a prophetic, symbolic place. Revelation 16, 16 says that he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now the question is, where is Armageddon? There's actually no place, no city, no location on the earth that is named Armageddon. Get your map, get your look it up. There's nowhere, there's no city named Armageddon. And to further complicate the problem, the Bible doesn't give us any additional information about where Armageddon might be. 
Now, of course, many biblical scholars believe that Armageddon is located in Palestine. They believe that uh, Armageddon is uh, in the Middle East. However, the Bible says it's called in the Hebrew language Armageddon, ha Mageddon, ha Mageddon, ha means mountain. Watch this now. And Mageddon comes from a city in the Middle East called Megiddo. So when you put ha Megiddo, it's really talking about the mountain of Megiddo. Now there's only one mountain that's near Megiddo, and it's a mountain called, and some of you might remember, Mount Carmel. That mountain was where Elijah met the prophets of Baal, where there was this confrontation between the priest of Baal and the lone prophet of God. And in the end, God poured down fire upon the altar of Elijah. It was a con And so the Bible is actually saying, uh, here is a symbolic confrontation uh, like it was uh, upon Mount Carmel. Now, there's something else that, that you ought to consider. This term, Armageddon, is not actually describing a particular place. It's actually talking about a world situation, a global crisis that cannot be limited to one place or one geographic location. I want you to notice, rather than focus on the mysterious name, the location of Armageddon, put your emphasis on the word place. The Bible says in Revelation that they, 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 they gathered in a place. Now the Hebrew word and the Greek language of the Bible, the same words have one meaning, and that is place is the Greek word tapas, and it does not just mean a geographical location. Watch this. It also means a serious situation. It means a critical condition. It means a traumatic dilemma. We use this, this, this word place the same way. And we're not always, when we talk about place, we're not talking about uh, 4200 East Berry Street. Because say, you, we say, you got me in a hard place. You're not talking about a location, is that right? Or oh, I'm in a rough place, is that right? You're not talking about a location, you're talking about a situation. Am I right about it? Oh, you've heard the old familiar saying, you got me between a rock and a hard place, is that right? And so a hard place doesn't mean a location, it means a tough situation. And that's exactly what the Bible is talking about when it talks about that Armageddon. It is not a geographical location, it is a crisis situation. And there will develop a crisis situation at the end of the world and it is not located at a place. It is, it is a situation. The reason why we know it's not a place because it says in Revelation that all of the kings of the earth and all of the nations will gather at Armageddon. It is not possible for everybody to gather on the plain of Esdralon or at Megiddo or the mountain of Megiddo or anywhere in the Middle East. In other words, it will be a worldwide war, a worldwide crisis, a worldwide dilemma. Let me, let me go further. The Bible tells us that Armageddon is not sparked by the Antichrist, that the wicked are led by three, by a trinity of evil, a trinity of evil. They're led by General Dragon, Lieutenant Beast, and Corporal False Prophets. Now God dwells as three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And so since God dwells in the three persons, a trinity, the devil decides he's going to get himself a trinity. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Now every Christian that reads the book of Revelation ought to know who the dragon is. That great dragon was cast out, that opal serpent called what? The serpent and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Satan is the dragon, am I right about it? 
Second of all, the beast, the beast. Revelation chapter 13 talks about a prophetic beast. And when you study Daniel in Revelation, you understand that the beast represents apostate, paganized, Roman Christianity. Paganized, Roman Christianity. In other words, it represents Roman Catholicism that has distorted the word of God and given to the world a false, terrible, mutilated gospel and changed the day of worship from the Sabbath to Sunday. She is the beast who persecuted the people of God. Finally, it says, and the false prophet. And, of course, there have been false prophets from Jim Jones, and, and there will continue to be false prophets. And, and one Bible commentator says not only false prophets, but they will use spiritualism and, and communicating with ghosts and spirits of the dead. They will bring this all together. And the Bible says, here's what the Bible says, that they will convince the nations to unite together, not because of their rhetoric, not because of their uh, the announcement, not because of their talk and their Twitter, their tweets like President Trump, but they will actually perform miracles and signs and wonders. You will come a time where you will not be able to believe what your eyes see. You're going to have to go by the word of God and not even believe what your eyes see. I can prove that. Magicians can pull a rabbit out of a hat. Not that there was a rabbit in the hat, but they fooled your eyes. Am I right about it? And the devil will fool us. He has power. He has ability to join the nations by his miraculous power. Satan will work miracles. Now, here's a big issue. How in the world are you going to get all these nations coming together? The Bible says, keep saying, they come together, they come together, they come together. You got Christian nations and you have non-Christian nations. You have, you know, evangelical and traditional Christians and, and even in the Christian world, there all kind of different denominations. Am I right about it? And then you go to the non-Christian world and you got Islam, you got Judaism, you got Buddhists, you got Hindu, you got Confucius, you got all kind of all the strange religions. Now, how in the world is the devil going to get all these people that believe so many different things together? The Bible says that the river Euphrates dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. That is symbolic language to tell you uh, that the hindrance uh, that has been dividing the east from the west, uh, the hindrance uh, that divides Christian nations uh, from non-Christian nations will suddenly be removed and they will now come together. Now, what will bring them together? The Bible tells us that Satan will literally appear as Christ. No wonder Jesus said if they tell you Christ is here, Christ is there, don't believe it. Satan is going to appear, says our inspired message, at different parts of the earth with glory and with power. And he will look like the description of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. There will be glory. He will perform miracles. He will quote the words of Jesus. He will quote the words of the Quran. He will quote the words from, 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 from the Hindu Bible. He will quote everything so he can get everybody to believe that a Messiah, a Savior, a world leader has finally come to end all of this, all of this conflagration and all of these plagues. He will convince them the plagues are falling and he will convince them he can stop the plagues. He can convince them if they will unite under his banner uh, that they, they can be united and, and that they will be able to, to forge together and bring peace to the earth. But the devil is not a demon of peace. Uh, he is a demon of trouble and war. But he is able to deceive the nations 
by impersonating the coming of Christ. Now, he cannot come like Christ in the clouds of glory with power and great glory. He can't resurrect the dead, but he will appear from place to place, performing miracles, signs and wonders. Christians will say that, that Jesus has come. Uh, the Muslims will say that the, a great leader has come. And, uh, and the Jews will say that our Messiah has come. And they will all look to Satan. He will unite them together. Now there's one final thing. The devil's battle is really against God. In Revelation chapter 12, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought and the dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And the Bible says he deceived the world. Now the devil lost that war in heaven, but do you know that he continues to fight? And Armageddon is simply the devil trying to get back at God for losing the battle in heaven. How will he fight against God? He can't go up to heaven anymore. I proved that to you. He can't get up to the courts of glory anymore. So the question is, how will Armageddon focus on the devil's battle against God? What I'm about to read to you is literally shocking and should put shivers in all of us that follow the Lord. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon, who's the dragon? Was wrought with the woman. Was wrought means angry. Well, who is the woman? That's the church, is that right? And went to make, what's the word there? War. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the word battle and war are synonymous. He goes to battle. He goes to make war. Who does he go to make war with? He goes to make war with the remnant of her seed. She goes to war with those Christians at the very end of time. Who are these Christians that he's angry with? It says, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you are numbered with those that believe in keeping all of the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus, the devil will get the nation to, to target you as the enemy. Not only will there be a national Sunday law, but the mark of the beast will mean that the Bible says they should be killed, round up to be exterminated. The devil convinces them if we could just get rid of these crazy people that insist on keeping the commandments and the seventh day Sabbath, uh, that we will suddenly have peace uh, and that the plagues will not fall. He cannot fight God, but he focuses upon the people of God. He focuses on the people of God. That's why the Bible says that Michael gets so mad he stands up and he comes to rescue his people. Can you say amen? The devil is going to put us under trial. I appreciate what Jennifer said and what she went through, but there are going to be bigger trials. Listen to me. If you don't really believe this message, if you don't really believe the word of God, if you don't really believe the commandments and the Sabbath, you will be pressured and persecuted and shaken out. Right now we are enjoying the greatest religious freedom that we could ever have and yet we act like I come to church when I feel like it, I don't come when I don't feel like it. What will happen when the doors are shut and commandment keepers become outlaws? You tell me it can't happen? What happened to those Mexican people? Did they get put in cages? You know, you know this stuff is happening. And, and you know, we, we think it's, you know, there's something that can't happen, but it happened overnight and, and they separated children from parents and, and put people away. It can happen, and it will happen. 
And that's why you better make sure that you are buckled up in the word of God. <laughs> you ought to make sure that you're making your peace calling and election sure. That's why the Bible says you better have that extra oil of the Holy Ghost. Uh, because if you won't have, don't have it, you will not be able to stand. I really pray for people that have a problem standing for the Lord. Now, and there ain't no trouble. Or there's minimum trouble when they're really faced with whether they will stand. You think that story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is just a nice little fairy tale story? Do you think that it's just something that happened and it'll never, ever happen again? You are absolutely wrong. If the devil has his way, he would destroy all of us. In fact, I'll take it further than that. If it was up to the devil, he would have been destroyed us. He would have wiped some of us out on the way to church. We've got to get anchored. We've got to get strong. We've got to get in the word. We've got to get filled with the spirit. We can't get mixed up uh, with politics uh, and worried about who likes me and who don't like me and who the pastor is and who the pastor ain't and what's going to happen uh, when you're in jail like Paul and Silas uh, and you don't have no pastor. How you going to make it then when there ain't no 4200 East Berry Street? Didn't that happen to the apostles? Didn't that happen to John on the Isle of Patmos? You ain't got nobody but Jesus. And if we're not standing for God now, how will we stand for him then? It might have seemed like a little test for the, for the Hebrew boys not to eat of the king's meat and wine from the king's table, but God was testing them, and God was getting them ready for when they'd have to stand uh, when their lives were threatened with a burning, fiery furnace. Am I right about it? I like, I like the one, what one preacher said, that when David faced Goliath, he'd already been, been victorious over the bear, and he'd already been victorious over the lion. He was not ready for Goliath. I, I wonder, will you be ready for Goliath uh, when the devil impersonates Christ and commands the nations to wipe out these people that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus? But I want to end with by telling you this battle of Armageddon and this battle of the great day of God Almighty ain't much of a battle. When I read the text, it just said they gathered. I didn't see no fighting. I didn't see no shooting. I didn't see any bombs dropping. I didn't see any missiles being shot off. I didn't see any nuclear warm. The Bible simply says that they gathered and that's all they could do was just gather. Get ready for the battle because Revelation 17 tells me that there's a last and final plague uh, to be poured upon the earth. Uh, Revelation says the seventh angel poured out his vial in the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven saying it is done. That means it is finished. And then the Bible lets us know that suddenly the voice of God is heard from heaven. He declares it is done. Lightning, thunder, uh, uh, plagues, uh, hail. But then suddenly somebody comes down from the sky. There comes another army riding down from the sky and it's not China it ain't India it ain't the United States it ain't Russia there's gonna come another army coming down to not just fight the battle of Armageddon come to end the battle of Armageddon they just gather because before they can shoot the first shot drop the first bomb he that shall come will come and he will not tarry John said I saw the heaven open 
and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him is called faithful and true. And in righteousness doth he judge and make, that is, make what? Make war! His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. Uh, and he had a name uh, that no man knew uh, but himself. Uh, he was clothed with a vesture dipped with blood. Uh, his name is called the Word of God. Uh, and the armies that were in heaven uh, followed him upon white horses, uh, clothed in fine linen. Uh, out of his mouth shall go forth a sharp sword, uh, that with it, there it is, uh, he shall smite the nations. Uh, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Uh, he treaded the winepress of the fitness of the wrath of God Almighty. And here's my best part. Uh, he hath on his vesture and on his thigh uh, a name written uh, King of Kings, uh, King of Kings, uh, and Lord of Lords. And when the armies of the wicked have united to stamp out the people of God, when they try to force a change in God's law, when God's people are threatened with their lives and are rounded up like sheep for the slaughter, suddenly there appears a dark little crowd about the half size of a man's hand and this star cloud begins to grow because it's pregnant with glory. Uh, this little crowd seems to be moving closer until finally it's full of activity and it explodes in dynamic glory and it reveals the heavenly army coming down uh, with an, uh, the, the leader who is the king of kings uh, and the lord of lords. It's an army that has never been seen on this earth before. An army that can win without bullets, bombs, or missiles. An army that has never lost a battle. An army that's led by the greatest general of all time. He's the captain of the Lord's host. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He wears a vesture dipped in blood. You read why he's got blood. He's been in the thick of the war. His garments are stained with blood. He has wounds from the conflict. Wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquities chastisement of our peace upon him uh, and with his stripes we are healed. He comes down to end sin. He comes down to end trouble. He comes down to end bloodshed. He comes down to end war and he comes down to end death. Here's the part I love. He comes to rescue his wicked, his remnant people from the wicked and from the devil, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. He comes to slay the wicked. He comes to put down the rebellion. He comes to end evil. He comes to destroy the devil and win the war. And as the earth is reeling, the thunder is rumbling, the lightning is flashing, the hail is falling, heaven's army comes down, uh, and suddenly the wicked uh, turn uh, and see the heavens departed a scroll, uh, and here's what happened to the wicked in this final battle of the day of God Almighty. The kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and every mighty man and every bond man, every free man hid themselves uh, in the dens and the rocks and the mountains uh, and said to the mountains and rocks, uh, Fall on us uh, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. Uh, for the great day of his wrath is come. Uh, and who shall be able to stand? My ancestors said they run to the rocks to hide their face. But the rocks cry out, no hiding place. Come to the caves crying, what do we do? But the caves cry back, we're burning too. Because there'll be nobody, there'll be no hiding place down here. I see Jesus coming down, riding. He's coming down to destroy the battle of, of the battle of the date grave of all of God Almighty. But he's also coming to get his people. He's coming to get us. I want to get on board. I want to be on board that, uh, that chariot. Uh, I want to be with those angels uh, that will ride through the sky uh, 
I want to be ready to meet the Lord when he puts down the battle of Armageddon. Uh, I want to be on the right side. Uh, I want to be on the winning side. Uh, I want to be on the Lord's side. And I want to be ready when he comes. Don't you want to be on the right side? Looks like the, the devil is winning now, but it's just temporary. He knows his day is coming. That's why the Bible says he knows that he has but a short time. The question is, are we going to be ready when he comes? I was high school. That was a big football game on Saturday night, not Friday night, Saturday night, Saturday night. And I certainly wanted to go see Southern University pray grambling. Oh, boy. Wanted to go. My cousins were going. My family was going. Everybody was going. We were waiting for the ride to come. And uh, I looked at my ticket. I said, wow, this is my passport to see this game. And brothers and sisters, we made it to the stadium. And I don't know what happened. I can't explain it to this day. I got to the gate. And I had no ticket. I tried to explain it <laughs> to the gatekeeper. He said, no ticket, no entrance. I tried to see if I could get other members of my family to help me out. No ticket, no entrance. I had prepared for that game. I had the ticket in my hand. But it was time to get in. Somehow I didn't have it. I should have been like the man that uh, he uh, went to a Houston, Texas football team, football game, and he had two tickets. And uh, they asked him and said, sir, you got two tickets. One of our people need a ticket. Won't you sell it to him? He said, no, I'm not going to sell it. They said, well, you don't need two tickets. You only need one to get in. He said, but I need this ticket. He said, well, why do you need two tickets to get in when it only requires one ticket? He said, because I know what I'm going to do. What are you going to do? I'm going to go in there. The Texans going to start losing. I'm going to start raising all kind of hell. They're going to put me out, and I need the second <laughs> ticket to get back in. The question is, will you be ready? Five wise, five foolish. The five had the ticket because they had lamps that were burning because they had extra oil. Do you have, are you getting that extra oil? Do you not hear the headlines shouting out, even our crazy president telling you, you better get some oil in that lamp because time is running out. The battle of Armageddon is coming. And our inspired messenger said there will be no in-between ground. You'll either be on one side or the other. You'll either be saved or lost. You'll either be with the armies of God or the armies of the wicked. The worst and most terrible thing is for you to have been on the Lord's side and switch sides. For you have been on the right side and been a commandment and a Sabbath keeper. But the end... You didn't have a ticket. Your lamp was dark. The real battle of Armageddon is coming, folk. It's not a political nuclear war. It's a war with conscience. It's a war of commitment. It's a war of deciding that I'm going to put it all on the altar of sacrifice. Late. I got to, you got to go all I said all, all the way with Jesus. Not some of the way, not part of the way, not most of the way, but all the way. It can't be 90%. It can't be 95%. It can't be 99%. It's all or nothing.